good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome uh, to this session, one and a half hour session about revalidation. And it's absolutely great to see so many people here. We've over 100 people booked this morning and we've been saying this afternoon. And it's really um, fantastic we have such interest because this is hugely, hugely important for you and your education. So hopefully you will get um, uh, you know, a good be good, feel better about revalidation after uh, this session. So, my name is Francis Cannon, and I am a senior professional officer with NICMEC, but I'm also the project manager for the uh, implementation of revalidation in Northern Ireland, and hence why I am here to speak to you today. So, I have aims and learning outcomes for this session, which I'll come to. However, um, the one thing that I hope you will get from today is I'm going to. My aim for this session really is to demystify the revalidation. You know, you're here obviously because you're interested to know what revalidation is about, and that's absolutely fantastic. And you've probably heard a bit about revalidation. You've probably heard people talk about revalidation. You've probably had chats in the staff room, and you're going, I don't know what revalidation is about. And there's, you know, there's different versions of what revalidation is and the requirements for revalidation going about. So I hope today we really demystify that for you. You will leave here today going, you know what, now I understand what revalidation is about, and I also think it's doable. So, uh, you know, that is my aim for today, and hopefully you'll be leaving today and going, yeah, I'm much clearer about revalidation. Okay, so where are we on the journey? Um, Sorry, Jonathan's down there waving that pink, <laughs> my iPad thing. I just want to check with everybody before we start. This session is being recorded, uh, video camera. Is everybody okay with that? Anybody have any objections? If you have, could you show your hand? Okay, and we will be taking photographs um, later on in the session because we're going to put that in front So everybody's okay with that. Okay. All right, gentlemen, that's fine. So where are we on the journey then? Um, revalidation and how we got to revalidation. After a prolonged uh, engagement, prolonged uh, consultation, and some of you may have been involved in that consultation with the NMC around uh, revalidation, uh, the NMC has now committed um, to moving from PrEP, the requirement of PrEP, to the revalidation. And that has really come about by registrants, nurses and midwives saying, you know what, PrEP is fine, but how robust this PrEP? And we want to actually have something that's more robust. And revalidation is seen as a way to actually do that. And it's about increasing and improving our professionalism. It's about ensuring that we're fit to practice. It's about ensuring that we keep up to date. And it's actually celebrating what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So after a prolonged period, um, the NNC have now arrived at this model for revalidation, which I am going to talk to you about today. But the caveat is that this is the model for revalidation that currently uh, the NNC is actually piloting across the UK, as we speak. And as a result of the pilots, there may be some changes. So what we're going to talk about today and do today and look at the requirements, they, there may be changes as a result of the pilot, but the thinking is that there may be changes, but the changes will be very insignificant, really. So what you're going to hear today is the model, which has been using the pilot. As a result of that pilot, which will be finished in May, and the expectation is there might be some tweaks, but it's not substantial. So you can be pretty sure that we're going to talk about will be pretty close to the final um, revalidation models. So, um, Without further ado, then, if we actually go in and look at our aims of this session. So, today what I hope to cover is provide an overview of the revised NNC code, which is this document here. And, quite, and has everybody received one of these? If you haven't, you may have moved dress, and that's why it hasn't got to you. You need to make sure that you have a copy of it. Because that has been sent out to every nurse and midwife uh, registered with the NNC. So, we'll provide an overview of the revised code and the proposed revalidation model because the requirements for revalidation are absolutely linked to the code. One is linked <coughs> to the other. We can't revalidate without actually um, using the standards within the code. So, we're going to have an overview of the code and then we we'll look at the proposed revalidation model and what are the requirements for revalidation. 
Hopefully, um, the end of the session will have increased awareness of the requirements of green validation and I'm going to go through the requirements step by step and you know, hopefully you'll be very clear at the end of today what the requirements are. We'll then, um, you know, <coughs> if we go through the requirements, the expectation is then that you will be able to identify how you might prepare for the validation. Because if you know what the requirements are, obviously then you can start to think about how you might um, start meeting the requirements for the validation. Now, during uh, the session, I will make reference to some of the learning from the validation pilot site here in Northern Ireland. Does anybody know where that is? Western Trust. So Western Trust is one of the pilot sites. And as I've said, there's 19 pilot sites across the UK. Western Trust is the Northern Ireland uh, pilot site. And they have 123 registrants who have actually signed up to participate in the pilot. So um, I will make reference to the pilot site as we go through uh, the presentation. Can I just say they really are just um, sort of at the stage now where they're the registrants and registrants are trying to meet the requirements for the validation. So there's not a huge amount of learning, but anything that we can or I may make, may make reference to any of the information that's coming through that may be useful as I go through the presentation. And then at the end of the session, I uh, will give you some information on where you will get further, um, further support or further information on them today. So the code and the validation. The code is uh, for everybody's protection, for your protection, and for the people that we look after. It's for everybody, like everybody's protection, and it's about it's about the professional standards of practice and behaviour for nurses and midwives. And the code has changed. Um, in, it was last revised in 2008, and became the new code has become effective since the 31st of March this year. So everybody should be working for the new code. So the NMC has updated its code of professional standards and it sets out the revised universal standards expected of nurses and midwives, which they must uphold every day in order to be registered to practice in the UK. So the new code is set out on the four things. And those four things, which are becoming known as the four P's, um, together they signify good nursing and medical practice. And the expectation is that these four things, which are prioritised people, and I won't go into these in a little bit more detail, practising effectively, preserve safety, and promote professionalism and trust. That if nurses and midwives practise against the standards under each of these things, then that should promote public protection. So, what's... Um, What's new in the code? Um, there are new pieces in the code that wasn't in our last code. Um, but before I come to that, there is definitely in the new code an increased focus on compassionate care, an increased focus on teamwork and ensuring that we work cooperatively within teams. There's an increased focus on record keeping and the standards around record keeping. There's an increased focus around delegation and accountability hugely important if you think about the teams that you work in and how, how much uh, care you actually delegate to uh, registered and unregistered staff and it's about your accountability in those um, when you're actually delegating. It's about the increased focus on raising and escalating concerns and there's an increased focus on cooperating investigations. So there are new uh, pieces within the code that wasn't in our last code and I'm going to first start with the theme of prioritising people. And I'm going to tell you within each of the themes what is actually in and where it sits within the, within the code. So prioritising people is really about, for me and when I read the code and the standards within the code, it's really about person-centred care. It's about making sure that the patient, we're always acting in the best interest of the patient at all the time. It's about um, working in partnership with patients. It's about um, ensuring respect, dignity, and the rights of patients are always uh, preserved. So prioritizing people. You put the interests of people using or needing nursing and military services first. <coughs> you make their care and safety your main concern, and you make sure that their dignity is preserved, their needs are recognized, assessed, and responded to. 
you make sure that those receiving care are treated with respect, the rights of care, and that any discriminatory attitudes and behaviors towards those receiving care are challenged. So those, that's the broad thing, and then under that there are statements, standard statements that you uh, is expected within this thing. And you don't have to, Pope's not saying that you have to meet every single standard statement under each thing, but that's the broad sort of background to the theme around prioritising people. So within prioritising people, what are the new areas within the code? Well, in actual fact, it says under, in prioritising people, you must treat people as individuals and hold their dignity. And they actually say to achieve this, you must <coughs> make sure you deliver the fundamentals of care effectively. And they actually tell us what the fundamentals of care are. Fundamentals of care include, but are not limited to nutrition, hydration, bladder and bowel care, physical handling, and making sure that those receiving care are kept in clean and hygienic conditions. So very explicit within this code compared to our previous code. Also within prioritising people, they talk about end of life care. And they say that make sure that you must make sure that people's physical, social and psychological needs are assessed and responded to. And to achieve this, you must recognise and respond compassionately to those to the needs of those who are in the last few days and hours of life. So there is a real increased focus around compassionate care, fundamentals of care, patient-centered care. And actually within prioritizing people, there is another new section that's around conscientious objection. You must tell colleagues, your manager, and the person receiving care if you have conscientious objections to a particular procedure and arrange for a suitably qualified colleague to take over responsibility for that person's care. And within the code, it's just one statement around conscientious objection, but then they actually give you a link. You can go on to the NMC website and you can get more details around conscientious objection. So that's prioritizing people. The next thing then is around practicing effectively. And basically this is around <coughs> evidence-based care, making sure that you're up to date, making sure that you're competent, making sure that you're always um, practicing within your competence level. So what it says is you assess need and deliver or advise on treatment or give help without too much delay and to the best of your abilities on the basis of the best evidence available and best in practice. You communicate effectively, keeping clear and accurate records and sharing skills, knowledge and experience where appropriate. You reflect and act on any feedback you receive to improve your practice. And when we come to look at the requirements for revalidation, these things become really important because in order to revalidate, you have to show, you have to provide evidence as to how you are practicing effectively, <coughs> how you're keeping up to date. So that's practicing effectively. And then we go to preserve safely. Um, and preserve safely is really about recognizing the limits of your competence. So practicing effectively is about making sure that you are competent. Preserving safety is about making sure that you recognise the limits of your competence, that you're open and candid, and there's actually a section around your of candor, and we'll come to that. That you act in an emergency without, uh, within the limits of your knowledge, you act without delay, and you raise concerns if someone is vulnerable. Um, and there's a piece in here in preserving safety about ensuring that if you're advising on medicines and medicines management, you always do it within your competence right? So, the theme is, what it says, you make sure that patient and public safety is protected, you work within the limits of your competence, exercising the professional duty of candor. And duty of candor is new in the code, it wasn't in our last code, and it actually says, the professional duty of candor is about openness and honesty when things go wrong. That's new. Wasn't in our so, I'm raising concerns immediately whenever you come across situations that are conclusions of public safety and risk. You take necessary action to deal with any concerns where appropriate. So, under um, preserving safety, they actually have a piece around medicines management. And what it says is you advise on 
prescribe, supply, dispense, or administer medicines within the limits of your training and competence, the law, our guidance, and other relevant policies, guidance, and regulations. So, the last thing then is around children, professionalism, and trust, which is really about your professionalism, it's about upholding your reputation, it's about holding um, your position as a nurse or midwife. It's about acting with honesty and um, integrity. And it's about making sure that you actually fulfill your requirements for revalidation. So what does it say? You uphold the reputation of your profession at all times. You should display a personal commitment to the standards of practice and behavior set out in the code. You should be a model of integrity and leadership for others to aspire to. <coughs> and this should lead to trust and confidence in the profession for patients, people receiving care, other healthcare professionals, and the public. So, under this section around promoting professionalism, um, there is a section which again is new within this code and it's around um, social media. And NNC recognises social media as hugely important in terms of sharing of information. But when we're doing or using social media, we must always uh, ensure the privacy and the rights of others. So what it actually says is, you use all forms of spoken, written and digital communication, including social media and networking sites, responsibly, and the right to privacy of others at all times. New section in the code. So, that is just a very high level overview of the code, but when we come to look at the requirements for validation, we can't revalidate without actually using the code and referencing code and showing evidence of how we're actually making the standards within the code. So therefore, it's important that we rehearse those before we actually look at the revalidation requirements. <coughs> so, just to... Um, As we summarise, what's new in the code? Duty and candor, being open and honest when things go wrong. Social media, making sure that um, the rights and the dignity and respect of any patients is not um, tampered with. Fundamentals of care, um, the code sets out standards of fundamental care and provides examples of what is included, such as nutrition, hydration, and um, environmental cleanliness. What else is new? Medicines management, acting within your competence or practicing within your competence. Conscientious objection. It's very limited in the cases where you can use conscientious objection, but there's guidance on the NLC website for that. And then end of life care. Specific reference is made to the needs of those in the last days and hours of life. And as I've already said, increased focus on compassionate care, kindness, respect and compassion, Team working, working cooperatively, record keeping, there's six clear standards to support all record keeping, delegation and accountability, delegate responsible and be accountable, <coughs> raising and escalating concerns, cooperating with investigations and others. So we're now going to look at what is revalidation. So every three years, you will need to show that as a professional, you are living by the code standards of practice and behaviour. You will need to make a range of requirements designed to show that you're keeping up to date and actively maintaining your fitness to practice. This process will be called revalidation and will replace prep. Prep requirements and the notification of practice form. So, how often do you meet your prep requirements? How often do you have to make your private requirements? Every three years. The validation is going to be exactly the same. So every three years, instead of uh, meeting the requirements for PrEP, you will be meeting the requirements for revalidation. And PrEP, when we come to look at the requirements for revalidation, it's building on what the PrEP requirements are as we sit, as we stand, okay? So revalidation is actually building on that and adding on to that. So, why is NSC introducing new validation? Well, the public expect all nurses and midwives to remain up to date 
and fit to practice throughout their careers. Revalidation strengthens professionalism through ongoing reflection on the code. So when we come to look at the requirements for revalidation, you are expected to reflect <coughs> on your practice and link it to the code. So it's about increasing the professionalism and influencing how you're making the standards within the code. Revalidation encourages engagement and challenges isolation because when we come to look at the requirements, the expectation is, and you have to, um, reflect on your practice, on the code, with another NLC register. So I have a colleague, for example, who uh, works in a GP's practice. She works, she is a sole nurse working in that practice. The requirements of revalidation means that she has to seek out another NLC register to have a reflective discussion with. Therefore, the thinking is that that requirement will actually reduce um, and challenge isolation. Registrants who work as, you know, on their own. Now, the next line is really important. Revalidation is a positive affirmation. It is about, look, I am doing a really good job. I am practicing to my code. I am actually bringing together evidence to show that I am practicing to my code and the standards <coughs> are And it's saying, I am maintaining my fitness to practice. It is not about searching out bad practice. Absolutely not. The expectation is that there are, there are 680,000 nurses and midwives um, registered with the NLC. With this new model for revalidation, those 680,000 registrants will actually be reflecting on their code, showing evidence how they're making standards on their code, and that actually should have a positive impact on public protection. And one of the I suppose the biggest criticisms of previous code was it sort of sat over there. It wasn't necessarily linked to your practice. It was something that you were reflecting on a day to day basis. And in fact, for many of us, it might have been just if you're going to interview, you would read up on the code. So this is about saying this is something that is a working document that you are reflecting on it, you are evidencing how you're making the standards within that, uh, within the new code. So, the process. Okay, so we've looked at the code, we've looked at why we're um, moving towards revalidation, and we're now going to look at what is the revalidation process. And this is sort of a high level view. <coughs> and I'm going to go very quickly go through this, and then I'm going to go through it step by step. So the code is at the center, okay, of um, the revalidation process. If we start up here, they, <coughs> we must um, show evidence that we have completed a certain number of hours, and we're going to discuss that in more detail. So we must evidence that we have practiced a certain number of hours over the three years. We then must uh, show evidence that we have maintained our con or completed continuous professional development. So we're keeping up to date evidence-based practice. We then have to show evidence that we have actually um, had practice and get practice-related feedback. We then need to reflect on our practice-related feedback and on our CPD and link it to the code. <coughs> we then have to declare that we're a good health and character. We have to declare that we have professional identity arrangements in place. So we do all that, and then we get a third party who confirms that we've met all these requirements. Now, I won't go into these more detail, but to see this reflective discussion, that reflective discussion has to be with another NLC register. That has to be with another NLC register who are actually reflecting on CPD feedback, linking it to the code, do all that, and when it comes to the confirmer, the confirmer actually could be this person, but the confirmer does not have to be an NLC register. Okay, let's go into a little more detail. Practice hours. 
You must practice a minimum number of hours over the three years preceding the date of your application for renewal of your registration. So, if you are a nurse, you have to do 450 hours. If you are a nurse and a midwife, and you're practicing both, you have to do 900 hours. And I, this is for, I've done a few sessions at this stage, and just to make this absolutely clear, because some people do get a bit confused, and it has caused confusion. If I am, and if you are a general nurse and a mental health nurse, you're on one part of the register, you do 450 hours. So if you if I am a nurse and a midwife, you do 900 hours, two parts of the register. Okay? So um, now I'm going to introduce you to this document here. This is a template pack that is being used in the pilot sites. And this, for me, was the thing that really made sense out of the revalidation requirements more than anything because this is a template pack that the nurses and midwives pilot site are using to bring together the evidence to demonstrate that they've met the requirements for revalidation. So the NSA is not saying you have to do, use these templates. Absolutely not. They're saying you can do this whatever way you want, but they prepare these for the pilot sites. And you can actually download these on the NMC website. But the NMC is saying in order for you to meet the requirements, it would be good practice to develop a portfolio, which you should have with the requirements anyway. But in this portfolio, what you would bring together is the information or the evidence to meet the requirements. So in this template pack, it says to you, you have to make a practice hours log so in here you have to input the date, you have to input the name and address of the organisation where you've done your practice hours, the type of organisation it is, so for example is it primary care, secondary care, <coughs> public health, is it um, care home sector, is it prison health care, is it school, is it education, research, what is the scope of practice, the, what area, what organisation, then what is the scope of practice, is it direct patient care, is it management, education, policy, research, other, Number of hours, um, what is the registration? Are you um, nurse, midwife, nurse and midwife? Uh, and then a brief description of the work. So that's the information. So currently in PrEP, um, when you go on to meet your PrEP requirements, what do you do? You just tick that you've completed the hours. Well, I don't want to confuse it, but what? The NNC is saying you need to provide or you know, gather up the evidence to say I have done my 450 hours or 900 if you're a nurse in the line. And that's the sort of information they will look for. Okay? So that is um, the practice hours. CPD. So currently under PEP, how many hours of CPD do we do? 35. 35 hours of CPD. So this is slightly changed. You must undertake CPD, continuing professional development, relevant to your scope of practice as a nurse or a midwife over the three years prior to the renewal of your registration. <coughs> of those 40 hours, so you have to do 40 hours, 20 must be participatory. So what is participatory learning? CPD. What would I do? Professor, should I have to do some training with other people? You have to do it with other people. Absolutely. So 20 hours has to be participatory. Is this participatory? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You're with other people, you know, later on when it comes to question and answer session. And that should, you know, participatory is you're doing with other people. Now this is a classroom setting. What other type of participatory learning might you do? What other settings? Practice and award. So you might be sitting down with a lot of scholarly team and a bit of learning, reflecting on something or whatever. So that could be participatory. What else could be participatory? Group supervision could be participatory, where you have done CPD. Also, um, 
you could do online, and in other words, something you can do online, but it's like a virtual chamber, that's classed as participatory. Okay? So 20 hours has to be participatory. So it's gone up from 35 to 40, 20 hours has to be participatory. So if I said to you, um, right, I have 20 hours when I'm sitting with other people and talking with other people, the other 20 hours can be individual or non participatory. So what would that be? Yeah. Reading a journal, research, um, reading an article, absolutely. Um, so, the other thing about the CPD is mandatory training will satisfy the requirements of CPD. So, say for example, I come to CEC and I <coughs> through my BLS physical support, um, I can put that down as CPD. <coughs> what the requirements are actually asking us to do is, in this template, you must provide information about your learning activities. So under PrEP, you would just say, I've done my 35 hours. You now have to give evidence that you have met those requirements. So I have come along to CEC, and I have done my three hours of basic life support, so I would say the date, today's date, say, method, <coughs> I was on the floor doing my mouth mouth with other people, uh, the topic, so I might put in their basic life support and I might put in uh, uh, the aims and the learning outcomes, then asking us to link it to the code. So if I come along to the CEC and I do my basic life support, and it, as, it, as it always happens when I come along, the number of uh, breaths, the compressions, or vice versa has changed. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, I come back to uh, write it all up here, my CPD hours. What part of the code is that like to practice, practice effectively? Absolutely. Or preserve safety. But yes. Absolutely. Practicing effectively. I have gone off to do my CPD, do my basic life support, things have changed. I now need to change my practice as a result of that. Then I will tally up my hours, the number of hours, and then I will uh, say whether it was participating or not. Because you have to show evidence that you have done 20 hours of participating. Okay, so. Um, Basic life support could be um, a very good example of mandatory training that you can actually say, you know, I work in a few or in fact, in work and in absolutely, uh, it can be classed as participator. Now, NMC actually say that FAR training wouldn't necessarily fall into that, but I thought somebody challenged me because they went, well, what part of the code might FAR preserve safety? Absolutely, so you could say it actually did. But anyway, um, you know, it's 30, so it's 40 hours over three years. And, you know, I'm quite sure for most of us that is a big ask. Uh, and I'm sure for most of us you actually do more than 35 over three years. But you must show evidence now that you have completed it. Okay. That's our CPD. Now, you must obtain practice related feedback over the three years prior to your new of your registration. So what the code is say, or what the um, requirements are, <coughs> you must get practice related feedback. And if we go back into <coughs> the code, can anyone remember where we were asked to, you must reflect on any feedback you receive <coughs> to improve your practice. Does anyone remember where that sentence sat on which thing? Practice effectively. So under practicing effectively, what the code is saying, or asking us to do, is if we get feedback, we should be reflecting on that, and we should be um, learning from that, and we should change our practice to improve patient care. So, the requirements are asking us <coughs> to obtain five pieces practice-related feedback. So, where would you get feedback from? Supervision? Okay. Sometimes patients, you might get direct feedback from patients. Or else, you get feedback. 
colleagues, your colleagues, absolutely, yeah. Team meetings, multidisciplinary meetings, a letter that comes into your team, a complaint. Um, you can get feedback from anywhere. So if you are in education, who would you get feedback from? Students, absolutely. Um, so people who are working in different places, where would you get feedback from? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Students, colleagues, thank you cards, letters, multiple team meetings, appraisals, supervision. Um, you can get feedback from wherever it comes from. Um, so you have to obtain five pieces of practice related feedback. <coughs> And I think if we become more skilled at this, we pick up all the negative feedback, because we can learn a lot from negative feedback. Um, somebody said to me, um, well, I might get feedback from my colleague. Um, you know, how can we be sure the colleague is honest and telling, you know, giving me the right feedback? You can get your colleague to write like anything. Well, can I just prompt you to and remind you about the code, about promoting professionalism and trust? I think we have to be um, professional about what we get the feedback from and what feedback we use. And we shouldn't be picking colleagues who, you know, we should be picking people who maybe will give us a little bit of challenge. So, five pieces of practice related feedback. Now, can I say that their templates from the NMC is actually saying uh, they don't get a template for that? I mean, certainly it was me because you might have practiced with really feedback and go across there. That would be a good example of something I could in. And if you don't record it, you can get it. So when we come to look at um, other portfolios, there's a practice related template in there. If I am getting practice related feedback from a patient, a colleague, somebody's given you feedback and you go, I'm going to use that, what must we do? You must get consent and tell the person that you're going to use that feedback, anonymize it, and use it. Okay, so that's our practice-related feedback, five um, pieces. Now, this is uh, where it all sort of comes together, and this is the professional piece within the revalidation model, okay? Because what uh, the requirements are saying is you must record written reflections on the code, your CPD and practice related feedback over the three years prior to the renewal of your registration. You must discuss these reflections with another NNC registered nurse and midwife. Mm -hmm. This reflective discussion, professional discussion, must happen with another nurse or midwife. If I'm a nurse, I can have that discussion with a midwife. If I'm a midwife, I can have it with a nurse. I, if I'm a nurse, I can have it with another nurse, or if I'm a midwife, I can have it with another midwife. It just so long as it is an NMC registered. So, you must record these written reflections. Let's go back to um, my basic life support. Going off to see, the number of compressions to breast has changed, and I decide I'm going to bring that to my reflective discussion with another NNC registrant. So, how do you reflect? What is a reflection? When you reflect, what happens? Say again? Yeah. 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 Okay. And when we reflect, what do we want to do with the reflection? We learn from it. Yes. So we start off the situation. What is the situation? So the situation was I went to see C and um, David Cohen and Chicken in my basic life support and I have now discovered as a result of that that the number of breast compressions have changed and I now need to change my practice. So that is my that's the situation. What did I learn? I learned that the Breast compressions have changed. How am I going to change my practice? 
obviously I'm going to embed that and I'm going to turn it into my practice. So somebody collapses on the water and then whatever, I'm going to change my practice as a result of that. What part of the code is that linked to? Our preserve set, you can put it under either. So if we go back to our templates in the NMC, they have a reflective accounts log. And in that it says, what was the nature, what was the situation, what was the same day, or could be a practice related to feedback? What was the situation? What did you learn from that activity? How did you change or improve your um, work as a result of going on that, undertaking that activity? And how is it relevant to the code? Now, say for example, I am um, I'm working in a team or working on a yeah, in a team, and I get some, and maybe I'm looking after a patient, for example, and that patient is due for discharge, and uh, the patient's discharge, and unfortunately, it's, um, communication has broke down, and there's now, um, this person is discharged, but the complaint has come in from the patient or relative or whoever, saying that, you know, they weren't told about um, the discharge plan, the district nurse never came to see them, they, um, all the things that were supposed to be in place prior to this person was home wasn't in place. So of course I will deal with that there and then and sort out <coughs> and sort out the complaint and do whatever I have to do. But I might say, do you know what? I'm going to use that feedback and I'm going to reflect on it. I'm going to bring it to my reflective accounts, to my reflective discussions. So first of all, if I am um, reflecting on something like that. What part of the code do you think that's linked to? What, where does it sit? I am trying, I want to see how I can improve patient care and put the patients first. Put the patient first and, and, and make sure that it's good patient centered care. So what part of the code, what thing prioritizing people could fall under there very nicely. So I might bring that to my reflective discussions, and I would say, what was the nature of the feedback? Well, in actual fact, feedback is very poor. Um, I wasn't, uh, you know, my care wasn't very well evaluated. Here's all the areas that went wrong. What did I learn from um, from the feedback? Well, I learned that in actual fact, we need to improve communication. Um, we need to make sure discharge plans are um, firmly in place and everything's. I's dotted and the T's crossed before somebody's going home. And then, how am I going to change? Yes. And then, how is it going to be? So, that is your reflective discussion, please. What does that remind you of? <coughs> reflective diaries of Kevin's student nurse. Absolutely. What else does it remind you of that process? Supervision. Supervision. To me, supervision is about reflecting. It's about reflecting on the practice. It's about what went well, what didn't go so well, what would you do differently if you were doing again, what have you learned? And what this is doing is how you're looking to the code. So what then the um, NMC is asking us to do, we must keep a record that we have done our five reflective, have our five reflective discussions. So um, you must keep a record of that, and that's a template that they're suggesting you could use. Now you don't have to use any of these templates, you can keep your own. But what you need to do is you know, maintain evidence that you've done it, who you've done it with, what's their NMC PIN number, and data information just to say that you have that reflective discussion. <coughs> so um, Five reflective discussions based on your <coughs> feedback, not, not five of each now, so it's five reflective discussions which can be a mix of your feedback and your CPD. But the most important thing is, how does it link to your code? And as I said, you do not need to go through the code line by line. <coughs> what these templates are suggesting is you can go through by theme. You can use the themes. Okay, so that's our reflective discussions, and then the next one is, yes, 
What was the nature of the CPD activity or practice related to feedback? What did you learn from the CPD activity um, and your feedback? What did you change or improve as a result? And how is it relevant to the coach? With an NLC register. Does it have to be the same person or is it five different people? It could be five different people. But you can also use the same? You can also use the same person, absolutely. And you could do, in the, in the uh, guidance from the NLC, you're saying you could do them all together. I'm not too sure about that one. I think there's something about uh, the quality behind your reflective discussions and making sure that you're learning from your reflections. So do those nurses work very long and all in isolation? They have to see very Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the <coughs> key drivers of the new revalidation model is to people who are working on isolation linking them in their professions to increase their professions. Okay, so then you must provide a health and character declaration including if you have to see any portions of convictions. And what portions of convictions do you not have to declare? Speeding, yeah. But anything else you need, and you shouldn't be waiting until the validation to actually um, alert the NLC. And just exactly the same way as we do now, you will take a box to say that you're a health and character. Mindful, of course, that or an honor register and if there's something you need to declare, you should declare. Mindful also if you have some health problems that your employer has a duty to make sure that reasonable adjustments are made to allow you to work. You then have to have this professional indemnity arrangement. You must declare that you have or will have when practicing appropriate cover under indemnity arrangements. Now anybody who works in the HSC and I um, with organisations who are group employed by um, healthcare providers, you are very likely to have this in place. Only on the rare occasion you might have an independent nurse or midwife who would have to seek out their own indemnity arrangements, which um, is probably linked to some special body. Um, so you have to do all those parts of the requirements and then you must get confirmation from a third party. You will need to demonstrate to a third party that you have met the revalidation requirements. And please note, a confirmer is then asked to judge whether you have demonstrated that you have met the requirements, not whether you are fit to practice. So NMC, the idea is, here's all my information, my requirements to make revalidation. <coughs> in a portfolio, which can be in a hard copy, or can be um, in an electronic version. But I have to bring all that to my confirmer and say, right, have a discussion with my confirmer as to how I've met those requirements. The confirmer will go through those to make sure they've met the requirements. And then the confirmer will say, I verify, yes, or the confirmer may say, no, you haven't done your practice hours. You need to go off and do your practice hours. And make sure you've done 450. The important thing is that every NMC registrant, every nurse and midwife, it is an individual responsibility for you to meet the requirements for revalidation and to ensure that you meet those requirements and go to your <coughs> The last thing you want to happen is you arrive along to your confirmer and in actual fact, maybe you haven't done your CPD, you haven't done for 40 hours. You know, you might be attended, <coughs> you arrive at your confirmer and now you're actually going to revalidate and you could collapse off the register. And anybody who's done that, it's a shenanigans getting back on again. So it's really, really important that you go to your confirmer with everything in place. So, <coughs> this third party confirmer does not need to be an NLC registrant, but it could be. And in most cases, it would be your line manager. And the thinking from the NLC is in most cases, that would be done at the time of your appraisal. So, do you all have appraisals? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, every third year after your appraisal, you would be meeting with your line manager to verify that you have met the requirements of the validation. 
Now, what does it look, how does this work in practice? Well, when the confirmer is a registered nurse or midwife, the reflective discussion and confirmation discussion can actually happen with the same person. It is recommended that this process happens in one meeting, for example, in an annual appraisal. And here's where I'm going to bring in a little, in a little bit of information from the pilot sites because thinking from the pilot site would suggest that the revalidation documentation that we're currently using can actually be refreshed to include and to help support registrants to move towards revalidation. So every year on year, when we go through your appraisal, there will be something within that appraisal documentation where the land manager would say to you, how are you progressing towards revalidation? Because the last thing you need to happen is that you're in year three and you have the <coughs> of, you're not working towards any of the requirements for revalidation. So, um, the ex now, the other thing to say is, NMC is saying, you do not need to have an appraisal to meet the requirements, but it sits very neatly with the appraisal. But if you don't have an appraisal, that's not a reason to not meet the requirements of revalidation. So when the confirmer is not a registered nurse or midwife, then the reflective discussion with another nurse or midwife must happen first. So you must go to the confirmer and have had that discussion have had that reflective discussion. The confirmation discussion will need to have happened after all the requirements are met, so you're arriving to the confirmer with everything complete. So, in summary, <coughs> practice hours, 450 over three years, 900 if you're a nurse and midwife, CPD, 40 hours over three years, 20 of which must be participatory and they must be logged. Practice-related feedback, five pieces. A practice-related feedback over the three years prior to the renewal. Then the reflective discussion, which must be done by an NMC register. And I can't stress enough, that is the professional piece within the model. Um, you must record a minimum of five written reflections on the code, your CPD, and practice-related feedback over the three years. <coughs> you must discuss these reflections with another MSC registered. Health and character, you must declare that you have a uh, good health and character, professional identity. Confirmation, you will need to demonstrate to a third party that you've met the requirements. And NNC are suggesting this should, the best way to do this is to, to develop a portfolio. But you would all have portfolios because you need a portfolio. You should have a portfolio to meet your prep requirements. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So how will revalidation help you? Um, by following a stronger process, the work that you do and the reflections you make will lead to enhanced professionalism because you are linking your everything you're doing and your requirements for revalidation to your code, which is your professional standards as a nurse and midwife. It will improve personal and professional development, an opportunity to talk to another professional and learn, particularly if you're a young worker. An opportunity to show the best work you do and to build up your career, pride in your profession through a positive impact on public protection, hand set of skills, because uh, it is building on prep, and up to date knowledge of standards and changing needs of the public. And you know, when I started off by saying our previous code sort of sat out there, it's really this is about saying that your code is integral to everything you do and keeping up to date and ensuring you're meeting standards. Okay. What I want to do now is just give you an overview of what's sort of broad picture of what's happening around revalidation. And then um, I'm going to do a question and answer session uh, after that. So if you've lots of questions, so I just do this a little bit and then we'll come to the question and answer. But just to give you an idea of what's happening with revalidation uh, across the UK, so there is a revalidation strategic advisory group at the NNC, okay? And that strategic advisory group um, is obviously insured by the NNC, but sitting on that group is four CNOs from the four countries and the equivalent of the other uh, organisations across four countries who employ um, nurses and midwives uh, or manage nurses and midwives. So it's a very senior level sitting at uh, NNC and they're sort of making sure that the four countries that this pilot is ongoing and the four countries are getting ready to move towards revalidation. 
So that's at NMC level. Underneath that, then, uh, there is a program board here in Northern Ireland. That program board um, is uh, chaired by <coughs> Chief Nursing Officer Sean McCardle and Heather Stevens, who is the Director of HR. And again, the Executive <coughs> Directors of Nursing across the five HSC trusts and all the other organisations who employ nursing advice are represented by that program board. And they're trying to make sure that at a local level here in Northern Ireland, that we are getting moving towards revalidation and being able to, um, you know, that we'll be in a, a state of readiness for revalidation when it comes. Underneath that working group, that, or that program board, there is a working group which is chaired by the Deputy CNO, um, Caroline Lee, and Angela McFarland, who is the Chief Executive of Bank Head. And they're the people who sort of do the work and make sure that we have everything that we can have in place ready for revalidation when it happens. So, um, when will revalidation start? In October, it is expected, and the NNC has committed to revalidation. Although on our work plan, um, you know, it's still anticipated, and that's the four countries have to say they're in a state of readiness to go ahead with revalidation. I think it's highly unlikely that they would say we're not in a state of readiness because they're not saying they have to be absolutely ready. They're saying they have to be ready enough to go towards revalidation. And the expectation is that that will happen in October 2015. NNC Council is expected to get the go ahead. And from this point, you will need to familiarize yourself with revalidation requirements and start to develop your portfolio. And it has been proposed that the first nurses and midwives to revalidate will be those with a renewal date of April 2016. This will give everyone time to prepare and meet the requirements. So if you're one of those people who's due to revalidate in November, for example, you will revalidate or you will just still, you will remain with the requirements. So they're saying that the first nurses will revalidate and see some spelling faces. The first nurses to revalidate will be from April. So if you are um, June the first of May, you'll be one of the first people to do Or you're June the middle of April, you'll be one of the first people to revalidate. So you need to start um, you need something to require for revalidation or not. Yes. Yeah. Now you will get a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of leeway. Yeah. So can I just continue on here and then I will take questions. Revalidation pilots. Pilots are currently running over 19 organisations across the UK. Uh, they will be complete by the end of May. The pilot organisations have been selected to cover a variety of settings and important circumstances for nurses and their wives to get the best learning from the pilots. And I mean, the whole um, pilot project is being um, researched and they're looking at you know, what were the opportunities, what were the challenges, what needs to change around the model, if anything. So learning from the pilots. Nurses and midwives taking part will be using visual revalidation guidance to, to compile a portfolio of evidence that meets the requirements, which brings me very nicely to this document here. How to revalidate with the NMC. This is the original guidance which has been used in the pilot. And I can't stress to you enough how valuable this document is. It takes you through each of the requirements step by step. And um, it's available on the NNC website now, but it is provisional until the pilot is over, okay? Because it will change probably as a result of the pilot. But if you actually Google how to revalidate with the NNC, it will bring you that document up straight away. It is very useful because leave it in the back of it. It gives you an example of what a CPD activity might look like. It gives you, um, you know, what should you have in your portfolio. It's all in there. Can I say also that the NMC <coughs> is of a mind that uh, this document here, and there's another document on the NMC website called Information for Confirmers. So if you are, for example, a line manager and you are going to be a confirmer, there's these two documents on the NMC website that you can, well, they're provisional currently, but certainly whenever the pilots are over, they will be made, you know, the final version, and you can use those to, to support you. And NMC is of a mind that in actual fact, a register, you can read this document here and revalidate without any other supplementary 
support. So, although there is also <coughs> recognition in Northern Ireland that there may be some organisations will actually access perhaps extra support from the likes of CEC. But the NMC is very clear that the information in those documents should be enough to be able to allow registrants to um, <coughs> revalidate. Uh, come autumn of this year, they're going to put onto the NMC website case studies of somebody who's revalidated. The, you know, this is been taken from the pilot. They're also going to put on examples of what is a good reflection. What is not a good, still good reflection? They're going to put on podcasts of somebody reflecting. You know, um, they're going to video a session. They're going to put on. Um, they're, they're going to put a Twitter feed on around revalid or around uh, reflecting. Um, there's a, a number of resources that they're going to put on, which will you can go on to the NFC website <coughs> and you can view them. Um, you can watch them. And so some of them are like information documents like this. Some of them are visual. Uh, some of them are interactive to support registrants to revalidate. So, nurses and midwives taking part will be using provisional guidance, yeah, and I've talked about that. Learning from the pilots will be used to refine the model before finalised guidance is published in autumn 2015. <coughs> what should you do now? Well, um, if you don't know when your revalidation date is due, you need to find out. And you can do that now from April of this year. You can go on the NMC website and you can actually put in your name and phone number and you can get your revalidation date. You need to read the code and uh, practice according to its principles. You need to ensure you're up to date on revalidation developments and tools by checking regularly on the NMC website. And the NMC website around revalidation has changed quite recently and it is, I have to say, very useful. Um, and this document here, the NMC comes in with quite a bit of uh, criticism, but I think this is a very good <coughs> document. So, um, yeah, that's it. Just in terms of what is an IPEC doing to support registrants, um, I don't know how many of you have a portfolio um, already, or a portfolio on um, in an IPEC or on an IPEC website, but uh, the portfolio um, website or platform in an IPEC is being refreshed specifically to meet the uh, requirements of revalidation. So it's actually set up in such a way that when you go on and you actually populate it, you will automatically be making the requirements of the um, NMC revalidation. However, you know, of course, I'm talking about NICPEC, but I'm not NICPEC, but there's also portfolios, um, templates and platforms and RCN and all sorts of other um, professional organisations that you can actually use. So it's not just this one. And the NMC says you don't necessarily need uh, electronic portfolio to do the current copy. Just before I come to that, so you have your um, revalidation requirements here, yeah? Your support portfolio, when I'm wrong, firmer, firmer uh, says yes, you've met all the requirements and I'll give you my PIN number and give all that done. Then what happens is you go on to the NMC website and you know the way you do your prep. Currently you tick and you'll be doing exactly the same. You're ticking that you have your practice hours done, you have 40 hours CPD, you have five pieces of feedback, you have reflected five times on your CPD and uh, feedback and you've to the code, you have your professional identity, health and character, you are confirmed, somebody with third party confirmation, you're tick, 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 and send it off to the NLC. You keep your portfolio, that is yours, you don't send that to the NLC. <coughs> but if the NMC, and they will be sampling, um, they may come to that point. So, in, just to say uh, what my text is on, so basically the online portfolio can help you with the revalidation. So you can create a period for revalidation, so the period would be many years? Three years. You then would record your hours and the, they, on this they will have a template or a template very similar to what I have talked here, so it would be the number of hours, logging your number of hours, where they are, scope of practice, etc. And um, you will then record your CPD, and there will be a, a template for that, and you can actually, uh, in this, it will automatically record for you or calculate, or the running total of your number of participatory hours. There will then be um, uh, a template where you can actually record your feedback, 
and um, it'll be actually put on a reflective diary type template. There will then be a template where you can record your reflections on the code linked to your practice related to feedback and your CPD. These two obviously you don't need to do um, at this stage on a portfolio, but you then there's this uh, there'll be a confirmation of that confirmation piece that'll be a template which will allow you to record all the information that you need. And the expectation is, although we haven't just got it yet, but we think we will, that you will be able to build your portfolio to meet the requirements of your validation and that you'll be able to almost press it well, you will be able to press it button and that will go straight to the NMC. But we haven't got that organised yet, and it's from the NNC's point of view, it is where the stumbling block is. But we think it will happen because the other three countries are trying to do that as well, so I think it eventually will happen. And that's on the new uh, front page of the um, NIPEC portfolio will look like. The online portfolio is designed to have all nurses and advice, and Stephen and Robin are keeping records of the practice of reflections and learning about the activities. It will help you meet the requirements of the validation and you can go in. There's three areas you can go in if you're a nurse, if you're a nurse, then one, and you can go nursing uh, students. So, that's going to be the new, um, that's going to be the new website. It's currently the uh, Belkin framework, it's going to change the portfolio. And it says the 27th of April, but I think that's come back a few days, so. Um, and just to say to you, if you already have an iPad portfolio, the information that you have will migrate across to the new portfolio. So, and there's more information. That's the NNC website. Also to say to you that on the NIPEC website, there is a, a tile around the validation, and you can go in there and get information, and we'll give you a link straight to the NNC uh, 